just waiting on Alder Winter. Misty, since we have a quorum, I'm just going to begin. So if you want to record, if it, it is recording. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Board of Alders Notice New Haven, the City Services and Environmental Policy Committee of the Board of Alders will meet on Thursday, November 12th, 2020 at 6 p.m. Video via video conference at https colon slash slash bit dot ly slash 3k oh 62a and by phone at 646-558-8656 webinar id 923-2642-8649 to hear and act on the following items for required password contact public testimony at newhavenct.gov item number one lm 2020-0399, order of the New Haven Board of Alders approving the painting of several creative crosswalks along Chapel Street in the public right of way along with Chapel Street Railroad overpass and the intersections on both sides, Chapel and State and Chapel and Union Street. Item number two, LM-2020-0404, Order of the New Haven Board of Alders calling for a workshop on UVC technology. Item number three, LM-2020-0428. Order of the New Haven Board of Alders regarding the communication from the Director of Transportation, Traffic and Parking, submitting a request for a workshop to improve residential parking in the city of New Haven. Per order, Honorable Anna M. Festa Chair, attest Honorable Michael Smart City Clerk, these items are on file and available in the Office of the City Clerk, room 202 at 200 Orange Street, New Haven, Connecticut, 06510. For accessibility-related accommodations, please call 203-946-7833-V or 203-946-8582-TTY-TDD. Public comment testimony may also be submitted via email to public testimony at newhavenct.gov before 2 p.m. on the day of the meeting. If you wish to present testimony at the meeting, you must register in advance at https colon slash slash bit.ly slash 3k0h62g or by calling 203-946-7934 or emailing public testimony at newhavenct.gov before 2 p.m. on the day of the meeting for the required password. Public can view the meeting at https colon slash slash bit.ly dash 3k 0h62g or listen by phone at 646-558-8656, webinar ID 923-2642-8649. The password to listen by phone only is 56804894. And just to correct the uh, the meeting at HTTPS, I think I said 3K0, that could actually be an O. So excuse that if it is a mistake. Um, welcome everyone at this time, I will have my committee introduce themselves starting with my vice chair, Alder DeCola. Alder DeCola, Ward 18. Alder Antunes, I believe he cannot make it this evening. Alder Roth. Abby Roth, Ward 7. Alder Winter. Stephen Winter, Ward 21. Alder Singh. 
Um, Alder Singh, you're muted. Alder Singh, Ward 5. <laughs> and Alder Smith. Alder Smith, Ward 30. Thank you. Welcome committee members. I also want to note for the record that Majority Leader Richard Furlow has joined us as well as Alder Carmen Rodriguez. Thank you colleagues for joining us this evening. Um, at this time, we will start with item number one, which is LM 2020-0399. I believe Elizabeth Bickley will be speaking on behalf of the Town Green uh, for this first item. Has she been added? Thank you so much. Good evening. Introducing the time. I'm going to share my screen. And Elizabeth, just for the record, if you could state your name and address before you begin, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Elizabeth Bickley, and I live at 862 Orange Street in East Rock. So I'm presenting to you all a project called Intersection to Connection. And this is our hero image that shows the overall look that we are um, wanting to present to you all to transform the intersection at Chapel and State and Chapel and Union Streets. And here is the project in context. And the goal of this project is as it sounds, it's to bring together connection between uh, five different neighborhoods that intersect each other at these streets, but have long been separated by railroad um, infrastructure and by these long um, routes. So um, we are working together with cultural affairs and engineering and a, de a local design firm out of um, Rector Square in Fairhaven. As well, as well as with uh, the residents and the surrounding businesses and its environment to imagine how these places can be transformed with art and light and landscaping. And out of those conversations came forth, um, here's also some images of the existing uh, location from the intersections to um, where the crosswalks are to the overpass that, that goes across the railroad. And from those conversations, two different phases worth of improvements um, are what we are putting forward for you to look at and specifically the crosswalks. So in phase one, we have already put out these planters that line the overpass. And then a part of phase one is are these crosswalks where that highlight all five of the neighborhoods that join at this site. And these would be uh, painted if approved, the design approved would be painted come um, late spring, early summer when the weather is warm. And we've been in conversation with uh, DPW and traffic and parking um, uh, about how to execute this safely for um, everyone, all the volunteers and the staff that would be, would be involved in painting them. And then, uh, Phase two is to transform the look of the overpass itself by painting it and by putting up these vinyl decorative displays that highlight some of the iconic imagery of the area. And we've been, uh, we sent out a community poll to get an understanding of what colors um, uh, the community would want to see. And so we look forward to announcing that when it's time to actually um, install and move forward with the project. And then lastly, with phase two, uh, we would be putting, uh, installing these welcome screens on either end of the overpass that uh, has cutouts and imagery that is iconic to each neighborhood from, um, from the buildings to the landscaping with lighting that, that goes across the way to make it a safe passageway at night. So, and all this would be happening in the public right of way, which is um, a key reason why we want to make sure that you all um, have shared your thoughts and you understand the project. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm sure my colleagues do have questions. I think this is a really cool project and anything to help beautify our downtown area and add additional lighting for safe streets is always a good thing. So at this time, I will open it up to my colleagues for questioning. I'll start with my vice chair, Decola. Do you have any questions at this time? 
that no questions at this time. Thank you. Um, Alder Roth, do you have any questions? Um, th thank you, Madam Chair. I being um, Town Green has done a wonderful job engaging the alders of the surrounding neighborhoods. So I have and and the communities of the surrounding neighborhoods. So I have had ample time um, to ask questions already. So I'll save my comments for discussion about I about this. But it's a great project. Thank you, Alder Roth. Alder Winter, any questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an exciting project. I don't think I have any questions at the moment. Thanks. Thank you. Alder Singh, any questions? Alder Singh? I think it keeps muting and unmuting. Uh, Madam Chair, I have no question, but my comment is, uh, you know, it's exciting to see this kind of improvement on our sidewalk and our bridges. It's gives so many, you know, welcoming flavor to our city, so to speak. So going forward, I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Singh. Alder Smith, any questions? Okay. Um, I do have one question, Madam Chair. Go ahead, Alder Winter. Uh, so you mentioned that the colors would be coming up for a community vote. And I wanted to know if you all had thought about the mechanics of the vote uh, because, and it's particularly if you thought of using ranked choice voting. Um, I know with the uh, Grand Avenue Bridge that that was, was really helpful there because they, they weren't able to get a majority of people for one color, so they did a, a ranked choice vote. Thank you for your question, Alder Walter. Yes, uh, ranked choice vote is the process uh, that we uh, have actually taken. We did we sent out a poll um, earlier in um, the fall, and we are um, waiting to share the results at the right time um, when the project has been approved and we're ready to move forward. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Alder Winter. Do any other colleagues have uh, any thoughts on this regarding um, questions for Ms. Bickley? I just have, you know, a, a question regarding the planters. I know that the Town Green District does a great job in maintaining the planters and any flowering or greenery that we have uh, downtown. If for some reason there's a car accident and one of the planters is damaged. Do you know if the insured, if the driver is insured, will cover the cost of replacing that planter? That is a great question. And I, I do not know the insurance um, detail on that. I do know that Town Green is has been maintaining it and is responsible for maintaining all of the elements of um, these improvements. And that's part of the understanding that uh, we've been talking with the city about. So um, it would definitely be within our purview to figure that out. Okay, uh, thank you. I guess we could get that information. If there are no further questions, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, again, this is a really exciting project and we'll be voting at the end of the evening, okay. at the end of the meeting. Thank, oh, you. thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. At this time, I will open it up to the public. Are there, is there anyone from the public that would like to speak on this item? Anyone from the public that would like to speak on this item? Okay, and for a third time, anyone from the public that would like to speak on this item? All right, seeing no questions from the public, I will move on to item number two, which is LM 2020-0404. And um, this is regarding the UVC technology, if we can have the presenters Join the meeting. UBC technology is actually something that we're all 
pretty familiar with if you haven't seen the advertisements for them. Um, it comes in many forms. So it's actually pretty cool considering where we are with our pandemic. Um, I will call on our majority leader, Richard Furlow, to introduce the item. Majority leader, the floor is yours. Name and address for the record, please. Uh, my name is Richard Furlow, 62 Fairfield Street in New Haven. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, Honorable Committee. Uh, I want to thank you, Madam Chair, and this committee, first of all, for hearing this item this evening. Uh, as we know, COVID-19 has had uh, devastating effects in our community, our general health, and our overall ability to move forward. Well, um, in many areas, uh, from City Hall to our workplaces, to our uh, schools. And so before this committee tonight, uh, I believe is a cutting edge technology for you to hear as we consider um, as a board uh, progressively um, and perhaps even pioneer as a board methods that uh, we may be able to better cope with cleaning, with air filtration, and some of the other measures that are necessary to safeguard our city, our children uh, during this pandemic. Uh, we know that there is some talk of uh, possible vaccination, but we have no idea what that's gonna look like. And so um, I want to thank you, Madam Chair, once again, for hearing this item as we look for ways uh, to move forward as a city uh, until this uh, virus is under better control. And so with that, Madam Chair, um, I yield back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that majority leader. And before we continue with the presenters, I just want to note for the record that Alder Adam Marchand and Alder Kim Edwards have joined the meeting. Uh, so at this time, if the presenters could introduce themselves, name and address for the record, please, and then you can proceed with your presentation. Uh, good evening, I'm Brian Axler, 12 Middlefield Road uh, in West Haven, Connecticut, and I'm on with uh, Mike Olson, the Chief Marketing Officer uh, for Stale Array. Hi, I'm Mike Olson, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer from Stale Array. Thank you to the committee for allowing us to present tonight. Uh, my address is Piscatico Road in Durham, New Hampshire, and um, I'll be presenting on the topic that Alder Furlow mentioned relative to our particular technology as a mechanism to fight uh, COVID and other pathogens as they arise. Uh, a little background on our company. Our company, Fire UV Sterile Ray, is located uh, near Portsmouth, New Hampshire, just north in a town called Summersworth. We've been in business for 14 years. We were founded by a physicist by the name of Ed Neister and his brother, John. Uh, Ed actually got his start in the laser business in the 70s, developing lasers that ultimately were used in uh, Ronald Reagan's SDI and built a sizable company here up, uh, up here in New Hampshire around that technology um, that he ended up selling at, uh, at a certain point in the early 90s. And it was at that point that he began to work with the Dover, New Hampshire wastewater treatment plant to help them with some issues they were having relative to the use of what's called germicidal UVC. Uh, for the disinfection of their water treatment plant. And uh, upon doing some research uh, for that project, he came upon some work that had been done in the 1960s relative to a different type of UVC uh, wavelength. And that UVC wavelength has now been branded far UV. And it was actually a 222 nanometer wavelength, as opposed to the germicidal UVC, which you all may be familiar with, which is a 254 nanometer wavelength. So uh, he worked on this project for uh, quite some time and then ended up uh, filing for a patent on the use of the new wavelength, the 222 wavelength in 2005. It took four years for him to educate the patent examiner about the differences between the wavelengths and why they were important and was subsequently granted uh, his first patent in 2009. Uh, we as a company have been making products around this particular wavelength uh, for 10 years. Um, and the wavelength is created uh, from a unique type of a lamp called an eczema lamp. And that eczema lamp is unlike anything you've ever seen before. It's not like a traditional lamp. It's actually created by a quartz tube that we create a vacuum in that tube. And then we pump into that vacuum, krypton gas and chlorine gas, which when they are applied pressure, form a molecule, an eczema molecule called krypton chloride. 
And it's that molecule when it's excited by a phased power supply is uh, actually emits the wavelength itself. And what's unique about the process that Ed has perfected is that that wavelength is uh, safe for human exposure and does not emit any other wavelengths that could be potentially harmful for human exposure. So that's a segue into my presentation. If I could share my screen, bear with me, please. And the first slide I have is actually, uh, it, it's a nice overview of the technology itself. It's a project that we commenced with Boeing Corporation in 2016 uh, to develop a touchless uh, laboratory for their airplanes. And I'm sure you'll find this interesting. Inside this airplane laboratory mock-up, new technologies are being tested for future application. At just the wave of a hand or the press of a hood lever, it's almost completely touchless. And now this prototype is going one step further. Using a new ultraviolet technology, the laboratory is automatically sanitized after each use. What we really want to do was take it and bring it up to date. And actually, now some of the technologies are, uh, are mature enough that we can actually integrate with this concept. Customer-focused innovation designed and developed by Boeing. So what we're doing is we're integrating all those hands-free and touchless features along with our, our UV sanitation system. So not only will the, cab the cabin lab look clean, but it actually will be clean. As long as the system detects nobody is inside, it quickly kicks in. And one of the great things about far UV is that it turns on and off easily. The toilet seat automatically opens, and a specific frequency of UV light flashes, killing 99.99% of every bacteria on every exposed surface in the laboratory. Uh, what far UV is really that going for it is that it is the resonant frequency of the molecular bonds in the outside of microbes, all known microbes. So every virus, every bacteria, and it literally makes them explode. But this type of UV light is different than the common UV rays that cause sunburn. Uh, far UV is a much, much shorter frequency. It actually is not a really harmful frequency. And so far UV actually will not give you a sunburn. And uh, in fact, actually, it won't even really penetrate your skin. As an added bonus, far UV technology is addressing another passenger concern inside the laboratory. A lot of people have had concerns or issues with the portable water aboard the airplane. And this way, if they do brush their teeth, the faucet has a UV uh, sanitation system built into the tip of the faucet to make sure that water is sanitary coming out. And with these types of advances, it's all about the best in air travel. Uh, we want air travel to be an actual destination in itself also in the future. And so the excitement of air travel, we want to be able to continue. A commitment made possible through unique cabin innovations, giving passengers and airlines even better experiences in the future. So as I mentioned, this was a project that we commenced with Boeing Corporation in 2016. In 2017, they actually won the Best of Show Award at the Paris Air Show. But uh, as you're probably aware, they've had some issues with their Boeing 737 MAX uh, jetliners, and they put the project on hold uh, until very recently where they approached us to uh, rekindle the project, if you will. Uh, I would just like to say, uh, first off, that if you have any questions, feel free to ask them as we proceed. Uh, some of the information is going to be highly technical in nature, so I, I'd be happy to answer the questions as they come up. The, uh, the UVC light that you may be familiar with and are probably using in certain facilities now or maybe a wastewater treatment plant is called germicidal UVC. And as I mentioned before, that uses a wavelength uh, at 254 nanometers, which is essentially just part of the UV spectrum. Our particular wavelength, which is created by these eczema lamps, is 222 nanometers. It's a shorter wavelength and as such has some very different characteristics than the UVC that's been around forever. And you're probably seeing uh, this in different forms, whether it be hand wands at Bed Bath & Beyond or on Amazon or Alibaba, you'll see some UVC stuff out there right now. One important distinction between traditional UVC 254 and our 222 wavelength is the fact that uh, it's much safer. Our wavelength is much safer. Uh, as a gentleman from Boeing mentioned, um, our wavelength does not penetrate the outer layer of the epidermis and as such won't cause arrhythmia or sunburn or in severe cases, cancer. Whereas UVC has um, been widely known that it's not safe for human exposure. So the use of UVC for disinfection has been very limited because of the fact that it, human, humans can't be exposed to it. 
Uh, another important difference between the uh, two wavelengths is that uh, our lamps do not create ozone, unlike certain UVC lamps, which produce ozone, which is not safe, again, for human exposure. And we uh, believe our technology is very environmentally friendly in that the eczema lamps uh, don't contain any mercury. Um, and when they expire, they are actually recyclable. So we take those lamps back and we just put in new gas and we ship them back out to the customer. In some cases, the customers actually maintain a small inventory of, uh, of those lamps as well. So uh, because of the safety aspects, of, we've been getting a lot of attention since the pandemic. Before the pandemic, our technology was uh, relatively expensive compared to other disinfection technologies. Uh, but because of the pandemic and the fact that uh, we wanna get everybody back to work and back to school, uh, we've gotten a lot of attention uh, because of the safety aspects of it. So when the pandemic struck, we immediately filed for emergency use authorization with the FDA and spent about three months in discussions with them regarding uh, the safety aspects of the technology. They asked us to withdraw the application because we aren't making any medical claims. So uh, three months of discussion basically led to the fact that because we don't make medical claims, we don't fall under their jurisprudence. We do, however, fall under the guidance of the EPA and we're registered with the EPA as a pesticidal device. But we firmly believe that in order to get uh, widespread use and acceptance of the technology, somebody like OSHA or the FDA is going to have to put, um, uh, put their stamp of approval on it. In the meantime, there are certain standards for safety relative to the different UV wavelengths that are actually published. And these are called threshold limit values. And these published um, values are actually put out by the Illuminating Engineering Society, which is all things lamps and lighting in the, um, in the United States. And, and they are accepted by the FDA as, as the de facto standards for safety. So what we're doing now relative to the deployment of our technology is we're adhering to those standards, even though we know, and IES knows as well, that when it comes to our wavelength, the 222, that the standards are somewhat artificially low. And so they're gonna be revisiting those and we expect the uh, republishing, if you will, of those standards in the January timeframe. But by adhering to those standards, we can deploy our technology into public spaces, uh, schools or wherever it may be, and, and ensure the safety, if you will, of people's exposure to the wavelength itself. Another important difference between germicidal UVC and 222 is how fast our technology operates. Where that's a lot of photons. And they, those photons actually travel at the speed of light. It only takes one photon to encounter a pathogen such as a coronavirus and destroy it. And so because the photons are traveling at the speed of light, when it comes to air disinfection, it's very, very fast and very, very powerful. In fact, um, our most powerful lamp, the 500 watt lamp can actually put out photons for up to a thousand feet. Um, and again, those photons traveling at the speed of light can disinfect the air uh, in real time. So for instance, uh, we, we had a conversation recently with the University of Michigan the Athletic Department about putting the lamps um, in a circular fashion around the field to be shining up into the uh, sections, if you will, where the people were sitting. And what we uh, prescribed was basically one lamp per section that could disinfect the air in real time with people literally sitting on top of each other. Now where that does fall short, however, is in surface disinfection because you need closer proximity for the lamps in order to get um, viruses or any other type of pathogen on surfaces. And I'll explain a little bit more about how that is and how we size for that. But suffice it to say, um, uh, this technology is very, very fast. It's also very, very effective. So when we put our lamps, for instance, in the HVAC air handlers at our local hospitals or other institutions, commercial office spaces around the country, what we have found is that we can get what's called a log four or 99.99% kill rate on the first pass of air through the HVAC unit. Um, and, and that's generally thought of as, as acceptable kill rate for any type of pathogen, but in particular this coronavirus. Uh, because of the exchange rate and how fast the air moves through the HVAC, that kill rate actually happens in about a 10th of a second. Um, in addition to our ability to kill pathogens in the air in, in essentially real time, we're also a thousand times more uh, effective than UVC. And this is all attributable to the photon energy of the 222 wavelength. 
very, very important that uh, you don't take our word for it. There's over 40, 30 part, uh, third party clinical studies that are out there uh, in the last 10 years that have validated on behalf of our clients, frankly, um, our claims and how this technology actually works. The upper left hand corner is an example of that. So this is a, a company LMS Labs out of Minnesota that did a test on behalf of the Leahy Hospital in, um, in Massachusetts. And what they found was that their existing UVC system that they were using in their HVAC system was relatively ineffective in terms of killing pathogens. And so they did some uh, air sampling. And when we, they installed our technology, they found that we did in fact get that log four reduction where UVC was getting less than about a 60% kill rate on first pass, important distinction. Another distinction that uh, has been found is that we actually destroy pathogens, whereas UVC simply puts them to sleep, which allows for them to be woken up again. They create what are called dimers, and those dimers can be awoken again by uh, the presence of certain amino acids. But you see in that electron microscope photographs uh, to the left that we actually killed that spore, broke it apart, whereas the UVC simply uh, left it as it was intact, but put it to sleep. Another important distinction about our technology is that the warranty or the lamp life for our eczema lamps is 30,000 hours. That's three and a half years of 24 seven use. Our actual experience with the uh, air handlers that we put these lamps in throughout the country is uh, closer to six to seven years before they expire. Um, but we do provide that 30,000 hour warranty. And by way of comparison, your typical UVC lamp is about three to 4,000 hours in terms of warranty. So if you look at the total uh, product lifecycle cost of our technology, granted it's more expensive on the front end, but over time, it's much, much more cost effective. The life cycle cost is considerably less than UVC. This is a list of our patents. Uh, it's grown over the years from the initial patent in 2009. Uh, it includes two patents in China, two in the European Union, two in Canada, one in Japan, and most recently one in India, uh, which only took 17 years to get that patent granted, but it was finally granted last year. Uh, what's not on this list is a patent that was recently granted for the use of the 222 wavelength for skin disinfection. Very important when it comes to wound care, and I think you're gonna see a lot more about the use of the UV wavelength uh, for uh, wound care and skin disinfection. And we have a patent pending that's actually going through an FDA uh, clinical trial process right now uh, for the use of the technology in eye disinfection. So we have an ophthalmologist down in Florida that's uh, been using our technology for three years to disinfect the eyes of his patients which speaks, by the way, to the safety aspect of the technology as it relates to, to eyes. So obviously this is our uh, current normal. We don't think it needs to be this way necessarily. And we've been approached by many, many different types of entrepreneurs and organizations that all have really good ideas about how to uh, take our technology and put it into different form factors for different purposes. So the tunnel concept uh, was originated by the NFL and the PGA Tour got on board, as did the NBA, and they said, well, why don't we just have people walk through tunnels and get disinfected, and then uh, everybody will be safe. Uh, we're not big believers in tunnels or portals, as sometimes you may see them, uh, doorways. And the reason for that is, as you walk through, first of all, are the lamps powerful enough to disinfect anything? But even if you were to disinfect something, you're not going to get uh, the creases in the folds, the wrinkles in the clothing. You're not going to get the unexposed skin. And most importantly, when they walk through the tunnel and sneeze and cough or whatever, it's all over. You have to start all over again. So uh, tunnels are not a great idea. And when we push back on the NFL about this, um, they reluctantly agreed by saying, well, it's really not about disinfection. It's really about making people feel safe. So which speaks to, I guess, the, the fact that um, many people are as concerned about the psychological aspects of, uh, of disinfection as they are the practical applications of it. Um, we've also are working with six different robot companies for the use of our lamps and their robots. These include anything from disinfecting cubicles at Fidelity Management's uh, offices to uh, cleaning or disinfecting the airport at you know, the Pittsburgh airport. Many, many different applications. We actually have developed a card ourselves for the disinfection of hotel rooms. Um, and uh, we have our first client out in Oklahoma that's been uh, using this technology uh, with their housekeeping staff to basically go in. Uh, and put it on a timer for one to two minutes, disinfect the room, clean the room, and then disinfect it again uh, very successfully um, without a lot of cost, I might add. Uh, we ourselves have created a hand disinfection unit that you see down in the lower right there. This particular unit um, has a lot of practical application, but unfortunately needs FDA approval 
before we can put it out there into the marketplace. So um, it's sitting on the shelf, quite frankly, until we get that FDA approval. Just a, a couple of slides about the science behind this. Um, what this slide illustrates is the difference between our particular technology and other technologies that are out there uh, for disinfection purposes. And what it shows is that a relatively low dosage, uh, what you see on the bottom uh, axis there, 20 millijoules, um, is sufficient to get maybe a log one or a log two reduction of this particular pathogen, MS2 phage virus. But if you increase that dosage to a moderate level, 40 millijoules, uh, at least with our technology, you're gonna get a considerable amount of reduction or kill rate of the pathogen itself. So it just shows that the dosage does have an impact on the ability of the technology to disinfect. Not all surfaces are created equal. So again, for this particular pathogen, uh, what you notice here is that uh, at least on metal, you have to apply a, a decent amount of dosage just to get a, a log two reduction. Uh, but it's much easier on plastic and it's considerably easier on glass. But if you increase that dosage uh, twofold or threefold, now you're gonna get to the area where you can actually disinfect all surfaces um, at a rate that's acceptable. So it just speaks to the fact that not all surfaces um, are the same when it comes to disinfection. Just pause real briefly here and see if anybody has any questions. Okay. I don't see any hands up, so you go ahead and continue. Okay, very good, thank you. So this slide uh, was a study conducted in 2006 that uh, you probably heard or at least heard reference. Uh, and that is certain pathogens can live on certain surfaces for a long period of time. And this is uh, particularly important in the healthcare environment where you get something like C. diff, which is very common in the hospital world uh, that can exist on surfaces for five months. And uh, unbeknownst to many people, if you get admitted to a hospital, uh, you have about a 20% chance of acquiring an infection while you're in that hospital. And you literally have a 5% chance of dying from an infection that you acquired in a healthcare setting. So it's very, very important to eradicate these pathogens. Um, and most recently, the hospitals are starting to pay much more attention to this because of the reimbursement, um, the Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement from uh, CMS saying that if you discharge a patient and they're readmitted to your hospital because they got an infection, um, the hospital actually has to pay for that subsequent admission. It's not, uh, it's not a freebie anymore where they actually do get reimbursed. So there's now financial strings and that's why you're seeing and we'll see, continue to see a lot more attention paid to eradicating pathogens in hospitals. Uh, this slide just illustrates some of the different form factors that the lamps take. So I mentioned the HVAC earlier. This one is at the Concord Hospital here in New Hampshire, and it shows four lamps that are between the coils on the left and the blowers on the right. And in addition to providing that level of disinfection I discussed, it's also keeping the coils clean on the left. So we've documented that by using this technology in HVAC air handlers, that you increase the efficiency of the air handler and therefore um, reduce the energy costs associated with it it's by as much as 25 to 30%. And in addition to that, you increase the life expectancy of the HVAC air handler by 20 to 25%. So uh, Fidelity has told us that uh, they've measured the return on investment of our lamps in these air handlers in terms of months, um, not years. It's a really fast payback. And to even further that, um, there are certain energy and utility companies now that are providing financial incentives to put this technology in the HVAC because of the increased efficiency. So it's much like the same that they did with LED lights when they came out, you could get rebates and incentives uh, for replacing your existing uh, bulbs with LED bulbs. And, uh, and that is now taking place in the HVAC world with our technology. The uh, light fixture that you see, the luminaire, if you will, next to it is a pretty industrial looking fixture that's uh, primarily used for hospitals and clean rooms, more industrial settings. Uh, we've contracted with two different lighting manufacturers now to develop uh, more applicable lighting fixtures for the commercial space, kind of the restoration hardware look, if you will, of uh, light fixtures in addition to our lamps. And uh, we expect that catalog to be out any day now, uh, but it will have many, many different iterations that are much more suitable uh, for commercial office space and hospitality industry and so forth. Uh, again, this is a close-up view of that air handler system. You can see there's not a lot to it. There's a lamp and there's an attached power supply to the lamp and the air is flowing uh, from the coils through to the blowers and disinfecting the air as it does so. 
So Concord Hospital uh, didn't want to take our word for it. And they did, uh, they ha again, hired an outside lab uh, to do air sampling of their operating room suite. And uh, what they found um, uh, was a little concerning relative molds and spores and other types of pathogens that were cultured. Uh, and then they installed our units and, and the, uh, the Petri dish on the right illustrates a result. So uh, as a result of that study, and we do highly recommend that people do these outside studies before implementing, um, they, they went ahead with the project. In addition to the HVAC, some, not all um, air handlers are of the size that uh, we would be able to install the uh, lamps in the air handler itself. So for instance, rooftop units are smaller. Uh, HVAC systems. Uh, we have developed a mechanism to install the lamp in the uh, the trunk line that would provide sufficient dwell time uh, to kill the pathogens, much in the same way we do with the HVAC air handlers. And this is installed by an electrician. It takes about 20 minutes. They drill a four-inch hole in the uh, the duct itself, and then they attach uh, that power supply that you see to the left of the lamp on the outside of the air handler. I'm sorry, the um, uh, the trunk line and we size the lamps to the width of the trunk line itself. So we're getting, again, the same disinfection rate. Some cases, uh, folks just don't want to install the lamps in uh, public rooms or in public spaces. So we have developed a, uh, a different um, iteration of the technology that includes a HEPA filter. And whereas the HVAC systems can exchange air six to eight times per hour, uh, this unit can do up to 40 exchanges per hour. And these are sized again to the size of the room. So whether it be office space or meeting space, conference spaces, uh, it's a really good solution if you don't wanna put the lamps uh, where people are sitting. This is again, the lamp that's being redone for more uh, commercial applications. Uh, we've also developed a hand wand. Uh, this particular wand uh, is either AC or DC, uh, the battery, powered version of this will use uh, an Ego battery that you can buy at Home Depot or on Amazon. The Ego batteries are used for lawnmowers and other types of um, uh, implements, uh, hedge trimmers and so forth. Uh, but we've developed a backpack version of the, um, of the Ego battery that's attached to this. So cleaning personnel, whoever it may be, housekeeping uh, can use the wand. And where this comes in handy is for disinfecting surfaces that are not line of sight of the fixtures themselves. So when you look at the overall solution of oh, how do you approach a commercial space, whether it be a school building or an office or whatever it may be, it's a layered approach and it begins with HVAC. If you wanna disinfect the air, every square inch of a particular building, you're gonna put the lamps in the HVAC and it will do that, albeit at six to eight times per hour. If you wanna disinfect the air, instantly with people present, you would put one of those luminaire fixtures as a wall sconce and we've created wall sconces around the lamps themselves. And you're gonna get a real time disinfection of the air with people present literally next to each other. So it's, um, it's quite the technology in terms of being able to disinfect the air real time. Um, it does have more challenges when it comes to disinfecting the surfaces because you would have to power up the lamps with people not present in order to get the surfaces in say 20 to 30 minutes, if you will. Um, one thing that we say about this particular technology is that if you don't do the HVAC and if you don't do the, uh, the lamps themselves, you can still do either a robot or a cart solution to disinfect and wheel it into a room, or you could use a hand wand to disinfect surfaces, whether it be tables, keyboards, um, whatever you might think needs get, uh, to be disinfected. So it's that layered approach that we take that we believe is the ultimate solution. Um, very applicable to the hospitality industry, restaurants and so forth, certainly applicable to schools. This is a unit we created to do both air and surface disinfection. It's uh, much like a ceiling fan. Uh, we've re, uh, redone this recently to have actually two paddles. So the square footage is now a thousand square feet and it can get real time air disinfection in that thousand square feet and also surface disinfection in, in a matter of minutes. This is a box we call the pathogen reduction box. This is a, a, a large microwave uh, profile that includes two lamps and you can put anything in it and disinfect it in a matter of a few seconds. So it has a quartz plate uh, between the two lamps that allows for um, uh, the 222 wavelength to disinfect anything that might be put in it. I mentioned to you before, these eczema lamps are like, unlike anything you've ever seen, this is an actual eczema lamp in action in one of the pathogen reduction boxes. And while UV light is not uh, visible light to humans, 
Uh, this particular light that you see here, this bluish purple light is actually the fluorescence of the krypton chloride molecule interacting with the quartz. So if you were to take this light outside, you would not see it. And as such, even if you were to put it in a movie theater or a commercial office space, it would not change the lighting spectrum whatsoever in either of those spaces. So this is about the time people say, well, this technology is great. You've been making products around it for 10 years. You hold all the patents on it. Why haven't we heard about it? And why isn't it out there? Well, we've been kind of plodding along as a small company up in New Hampshire, making a couple dozen lamps per month for very specific applications, anything from cannabis to clean rooms to uh, food packaging and processing. But it wasn't until the pandemic hit that people now really are paying attention to disinfection. And it's not going to be just this COVID virus. This is now something we liken to the 9-11 moment of disinfection where people now appreciate how important it is to disinfect the air and surfaces uh, where people are present. So instead of just, uh, ramping up our production, if you will, to this, try and meet the demands of the marketplace, we've actually now licensed our technology to three different manufacturing partners who are just the beginning of our ability to scale the production. Uh, we've gone from seeing the demand for our lamps from a couple dozen a month to about a 10,000 run rate per week demand with some of the conversations that we're having with, whether it be Dallas Fort Worth Airport or school systems throughout the country, uh, municipalities such as yourselves, uh, the demand is certainly there. And you can perhaps see the utility of the technology uh, for many, many different types of uh, industries and vertical markets. So that's my presentation. I'm certainly welcome to take any questions if anybody has any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Olson. That was a great presentation. I think it's re really relevant to our current situation. And unfortunately, it might be also to future situations since with global warming, uh, more viruses could make themselves known. I felt like I was in an episode of Superman and Ghostbuster instead of Ghostbuster germ buster. So <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. all joking aside at this point, I'm gonna open it up to my um, colleagues for any questions at this time. So I will start with my vice chair, Alder DeCola. No questions at this time. Alder Roth. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for that um, thorough presentation. I do have a few questions. I, um, I guess I have no idea of the cost. If you could sort of walk through, you know, I know there's a number of, you gave many examples of the different types um, from the wand to the lamps and ever, just if you could kind of walk through some of those costs. Sure. So uh, for the HVAC units, uh, it's dependent upon the size of the HVAC, which is really dependent upon the size of the facility. Um, but the cost uh, is, is fairly high initially. It's probably on the order of anywhere between $4,000 and $8,000 per 10,000 CFM. But as I mentioned before, the return on investment for HVAC is probably the greatest return on investment you can realize uh, from any application because of the increased energy efficiency and the rebates and the incentives that are now out there. So we highly recommend looking at HVAC as your starting point because of the, uh, the return on that initially fairly high cost. Um, as it relates to the cost of putting the fixtures, say in a school classroom, you probably would need no more than one fixture and that fixture would run somewhere around $3,000, um, which again on the surface seems pretty expensive, but these fixtures will, will last for um, three and a half years, 24 seven. And they obviously don't need to be powered on um, when uh, the students or the pupils are not present. And again, the same would apply for commercial space too. So it, it's not an inexpensive technology, but uh, we look at it from the standpoint that uh, it's still very early in our ability to produce these things. And with the help of our licensed partners, we expect to see within 12 months, the cost come down about 50%. And the way that we typically operate uh, was will be that we would go through a kind of a design phase of a, a particular project that takes maybe one or two uh, very short meetings to look at the HVAC, to look at the size of the, the room or the facility, and then uh, provide a proposal. So just as a kind of an order of magnitude reference, your typical 4,000 square foot restaurants right now would probably be about $25,000 to thoroughly cover it between uh, the food prep area, the HVAC, the lamps and where people are dining and the, the wands that the servers would use. Um, but again, we, we see those costs coming down over time. Um, th thank you for that. And th this might, you may have stated this in what you said, and I just want to be clear, I understand it. I know 
that um, the, the product sort of attacks all sorts of things and over the years has been used for in, in other situations has, has, I guess, has it specifically been proven that it would kill the coronavirus? But I feel like it's still so new exactly how, so if, kind of maybe just walk through that. Yeah, great question and very timely because there was just a study published out of Hiroshima University in Japan about a month ago that did document uh, this technology will eradicate the existing COVID-19. Great. And um, I, I'll ask one final question for now and then I'll defer to my colleagues. Um, I guess, could you just give examples of other, um, it was interesting to hear that you're sort of now outsourcing to these different manufacturers and the volume of requests you have. What, what other municipalities have you just give some examples and how how are, are they focusing on schools? Are they, I mean, obviously the kind of commercial buildings in any city, it would be up to those private companies to reach out to you. But so kind of both the who and how are different people thinking of using it in those municipalities? Good question. And the best answer is that we're still very early in this because of the, uh, the pandemic and our ability to produce these lamps is very limited. Um, we have scaled our production now to where by the end of the year, we'll be able to produce about 1,200 lamps per week, as opposed to about 12 lamps per day. So uh, we're rapidly scaling the production. And as I said, the licensees, uh, in cooperation with our licensees, we should be able to approach reasonably the demand that's out there. But in terms of widespread implementation of the technology, um, we haven't seen it with the municipalities yet. We see uh, anecdotal things such as, uh, as I said, wastewater treatment plants, um, a lot of times buildings, facilities, HVAC is certainly a, a quick candidate to do this, um, but it, it's very early still. I think you're going to start seeing more deployment in the uh, municipality environment probably mid next year is what we see. Great. Thank, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, and thank you, Madam Chair. I'll defer to my colleagues now. Thank you, Alder Roth. Um, you, you just mentioned, you know, uh, municipalities. Has it been installed in schools? I see right now the way things are going, kids remote learning um, because schools, HVAC systems need filtration, et cetera. Are there any examples out there of this being installed in schools? Not in a uh, large scale. Uh, we did just uh, sign our first agreement with a uh, a private uh, school, elementary school uh, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, actually, for widespread implementation of the technology um, as a, uh, we would call it a prototype project. So again, it's probably going to be the middle of next year before you see uh, a few case studies. Um, this one's going to commence in January. We'll have data uh, in the May-June timeframe and, uh, and others will follow as a result. But no, definitely it's still too early in the um, deployment of the technology. Great. Um, I will now ask if uh, Alder Winter has any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. You'd, you'd mentioned uh, like the various federal government agencies that are involved in looking at something like this and also mentioned the hospital in New Hampshire that had done a private study. Um, are there, you know, as the CDC issues guidance, have they issued guidance around UV sterilization for things like HVAC systems? Uh, and are there, yeah, are there a, approvals or certifications that the company would be seeking as they look to work with places like New Haven? Yeah, so the CDC has issued a white paper, um, uh, not just on uh, UV, uh, C or RUV, uh, but on many different types of technologies and they've issued some guidance. It's, um, it's pretty benign. They're not really putting any kind of stake in the ground in terms of uh, which ones uh, are worth considering. Um, you're probably aware there's a lot of different people out there selling a lot of different products right now, making a lot of different claims. So it would be beneficial if, if somebody like the FDA did weigh in. Um, in our discussions with the FDA, uh, they did indicate that this technology is at the very highest level of the federal government in terms of discussion. And they're still trying to figure out, does it belong to the EPA? Does it belong to um, the FDA, perhaps OSHA? Um, so they're trying to sort out who actually would own uh, the administration and uh, certification of this technology. 
um, because it's such a critical um, uh, technology for the problem at hand, I think that you'll probably see some movement on it over the next few months, especially with the political atmosphere changing potentially, or at least stabilizing. Um, and once that's all settled, then I think they're going to probably uh, move forward with uh, some further review or analysis of the technology, and then ultimately uh, provide further guidance. Uh, the FDA does have a white paper out. Um, again, it's much like uh, the CDC white paper. It just talks about the technologies. It doesn't really speak to the pros and cons or make any recommendations about it. It's really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam sure. Chair. Madam Chair, you're on mute. Oh, yes, I am. <clears throat> um, thank you, Alder Winter. Alder Singh, any questions? No question at this time, Madam Chair. It's a very new technology, and I guess we could just have to sit back and see, you know, where the development goes with this in terms of its use in a municipal building. So, and have some data on this, but, you know, it's a good headway in it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Alder Singh. Alder Smith, any questions? Just one question. Um, I understand that this UV is trying to prevent the coronavirus. What is the risk of cancer, cancer risk towards this? Uh, there, as far as the studies that we have at hand show and demonstrate, there is no risk of cancer with this particular wavelength. There is a risk of cancer for the UVC wavelength of 254, which is the one that's been around for quite some time. And so that's why we've been very careful to try and rebrand this particular UVC wavelength as far UV as opposed to UVC, because there's an important distinction to be made that this particular wavelength will not penetrate the skin and therefore not cause cancer. So uh, there's some good work that's being done at Columbia University. Dr. David Brenner right now is in the last couple of weeks of us, um, a longitudinal study on um, mice that have actually been bred to have the same epidural layer as human skin. And uh, he's been exposing those mice to this wavelength for eight hours a day for nearly a year now. Uh, with with no visible signs or other signs anyways of of any damage to um, to the skin or any other surfaces. So uh, it's going to require probably a couple more of those types of studies. There's some good work coming out of Japan right now, Kobe University, as I mentioned, Hiroshima University. Um, uh, but it's still early. We need probably need another you know two or three uh, major studies to come out before uh, it's going to become widely accepted. All set, Alder Smith? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. No further yeah. questions. Thank you. Um, I'll open it up to my colleagues. If there are any additional questions, please raise your hand um, on the, not in your window, but on your computer or phone. And I will also open it up to my colleagues who are not on the committee anyone who is present that would like to ask any questions from the Board of Alders, please raise your hand and I'm happy to call on you. Okay, I don't see any hands or you can just unmute yourself and speak that you have a question. Okay, seeing none. Um, you know, I really appreciate this presentation. The technology on it was very impressive. I think it's something that is going to be useful, whether it be with coronavirus or future viruses. And being a germaphobe, I would have one installed in my house <laughs> once it be becomes more affordable. Um, so I appreciate your presentation. I will open it up to the public. So at this time, if there is anyone from the public that would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand. For the second time, if there is anyone from the public that would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand. And for the third time, anyone from the public that has any questions on this item, please raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, thank you again for your presentation and we will move on to our third item. Um, we look forward to further discussions on this, Mr. Olson. So thank, thank you. Thank you to the committee. Thank you very much. At this time, we'll hear item number three, LM 2020-0428.
and it will be with our Director of Transportation, Traffic and Parking, Doug House Layden. And Mr. House, if you are there, state your name and address for the record, along with anyone else who is here to present, if they can state their name and address for the record, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Doug Hausleden from uh, TTMP 115 South Water Street in New Haven. I'll uh, ask my uh, associate, Holly Parker from Less Road Travel to introduce herself. Hi there, and thank you for having me here today. I am Holly Parker and my company is called Less Road Traveled and I reside at 1829 Asylum Avenue in West Hartford. Holly, will we have Carolyn Luce with us as well today or is it just you and I? It's just the two of us. Perfect. Uh, Madam Chair, if it's okay with you, we'll, we'll, I'll uh, introduce Holly and ask her to, to kind of key off our presentation. If that's all right with you, Madam Chair. Go right ahead, thank you. Well, my pleasure. Uh, so um, thank you committee members and staff and, and the audience for uh, the opportunity to present tonight. This is a project update from the department. We are um, in a moment of, uh, we are in a moment of feedback. So we, we have submitted an item for you tonight a work, in a workshop to go over an idea we have uh, to help make residential parking easier uh, and more uh, simple for constituents. Um, for the, just as a reminder of where we are today, uh, residential zones are um, governed by, and if, um, uh, I'll just sh quickly share my screen. Um, uh, they're, they're governed by our um, uh, municipal code, X section 29-55 of our, of our code. Um, here they are right here. Um, so, uh, just as a reminder for how things process presently, um, first a zone is created at the Board of Alders through petition. Um, so through, through a legislative item, uh, a zone is created. And after zones are created, folks then register their vehicles uh, to get decals, visitor permits, we install signage, um, and uh, it's a two-step process. Excuse me one second. I'm already confusing myself more, I apologize. Um, it's a two-step process to get a residential parking uh, restriction. And um, let me just show you, uh, apologies, what the map looks like. Um, and uh, we're here today to talk about something we've been talking about for a number of years, I think, which is um, uh, how do we simplify this effort to make it a little faster and more, more understandable for the residents and for alders? So presently, if you see, and I'll zoom in a little bit, you see, uh, we'll take something like uh, our neighborhood in the hill here. We have zone 14, it stretches from El Grosso Boulevard to Washington Spring, Church Street South to South Frontage Road. Um, that is the zone 14. It's a very large zone that covers most of the hill. I see the alder from Ward 5 nodding. That's right. Um, the blue streets, however, are where the restriction for residential only parking exists. So Daggett Street, Vernon Ward Asylum, Elliott Sylvan, uh, a, a little bit more in minor. Now this is outdated. Alder from Ward 6 has recently added Port C Street, Carlisle Street, and things like that. Um, but it's a two-step process. First step is at the Board of Alders with a petition of the people on the street. We create the zone, like zone 14. The second step is at the traffic authority. Uh, with the same petition, we go to the traffic authority and create the blue lines on the map. Um, so we're here today to talk about how do we, how do we normalize and create a, a sensical map with a bunch of zones on it. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And I'll stop. Uh, messing it up and turn it over to Holly Parker to hopefully make some more sense of, of this uh, workshop tonight. Great. Thanks, Doug. I will now share my screen. And we've put together a way to sort of visualize what we're trying to uh, help help you understand we made a story <laughs> because that, that's usually the best way to um, to, to um, present something that's kind of complicated. So we have maps and, and pictures to go along with the story. 
Can you all see my screen? Okay, should say neighborhood parking. Okay. Yes. Great, thank you. All right, so because there is tension in neighborhoods that gets caused by uh, people who are non-residents coming in and, and taking parking spaces, we've decided to um, look at how we can alleviate this tension. And although residents aren't necessarily guaranteed parking spots near their homes, they should certainly have the priority in finding parking. Um, they should have priority um, for parking in their neighborhoods. So we started by looking at um, where transit is located. Um, and this is an example of the Hill neighborhood, which Doug was just uh, alluding to. These light purple circles are showing a 250 foot radius around each transit seat. These are CT transit stops. Um, and we looked at this because we thought it was important to understand uh, whether people could potentially be parking in neighborhoods and then getting on a CT transit bus to complete their trip. Um, a lot of people are trying to evade expensive parking. Um, and as such, you know, we wanted to understand the transit environment. So we also looked at the Yale shuttle stops and the Yale New Haven hospital shuttle stops. And you see in this example of the Hill neighborhood, there is a lot of transit going on. So um, we then added onto that um, the, top, the 25 largest employers in New Haven. And we saw that there are quite a few of them in the same neighborhood, um, creating more competition for parking uh, between residents and non-residents. And this green area here is showing where there is activated residential um, permitting on the street. So I, I apologize, there's a lot going on here, <laughs> but it's sort of a, a good illustration of how complex the environment is and, and how frustrating um, it, it, we understand it can be for people to find parking um, who, who live here. So we wanted to, um, next we looked at um, how we could maybe divide up the neighborhoods of New Haven differently so that we could create residential parking, you know, quickly and wherever it's needed. So the blue areas here are indicating streets with residential zoning. And uh, these are the areas we're gonna be looking at um, for neighborhood parking permits. So um, we are looking to you for your guidance on um, approval of this, this concept, which we'll get into more detail in a moment, um, so that so that individual elders can make requests to activate neighborhood parking on a street by street basis. Uh, these, the green area is zoned for central business district and, and won't be part of um, the discussion and the purple areas are, are roughly uh, Yale residential areas. So residents who live in buildings part of the general business, neighborhood center mixed use and commercial gateway district zoning areas will still be eligible for permits um, to park on adjacent residential streets, but restricted residential parking will, won't be available in the general business and neighborhood center zoned areas. And you can ask Doug more about that <laughs> in the question and answer portion. Um, so what we've done is we put together packets of information for each alder, which you should have received uh, maybe Tuesday, um, either in your inbox or in your mailbox um, that show these areas of, um, that show the neighborhoods and how we have split them up um, based essentially on major roadways and land uses. Um, but this is, we, we mostly wanted to give you something to react to 
So nothing here is set in stone. This is by way of, of giving you something to, um, to look at and to comment on. And we'd be happy to take your, um, your guidance, your, your opinions, your um, you know, thoughts from your constituents uh, by whatever means. You can, you can write on the maps that we mailed or, or we'll put in your mailboxes. Um, you can you can email us. You can just make it narrative what your comments are, and email them. Uh, Doug, do you want to take them? Do you want to take the comments, or should they come to me? Uh, they can. Why don't they go to I, both of us? Uh, but we'll, we'll, can you share your contact information? I mean, yes. it's in the packet we sent out. I'm sure. So, um, so so just just to kind of go back high level. To parking, residential parking has a parking zone and then the, the street. And what we're trying to do is create zones. This does not create any new restrictions, does not create any new residential parking streets. It just takes all of the zone guesswork out in the future. That way for the, if you do turn on a street later on, and by you, I mean, if a board of alder representative turns a street on, by going to the traffic authority and doing a 51% petition, um, we'll know what zone they bought into, sort of how to process that and make it go faster for everyone. What we'd like to do uh, is we'd like to use the chair for Ward 10 and East Rock, uh, as well as Quinnipiac Meadows um, uh, and a little bit of Fair Haven. We'd love to be able to use Ward 10 to show what we'd like each of, each of you to do uh, in your spare time or through us with a, with a Zoom meeting, we can do it together. We're really hoping to get your localized knowledge to see if these boundaries are the correct boundaries for the zones. Holly, you wanna lead us through that exercise for Ward 10 and or East Rock? Sure. Um, I think I'll start with the reference map because that, um, that, sh that was created as a way to guide guide you all through um, some of the, the complexities of, um, <laughs> of parking <laughs> in neighborhoods. Um, are, do you see a map now that shows uh, some orange lines in the East Rock neighborhoods and Prospect Hill? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. So um, you would, you received a link in the packets of information we sent out to this map and the idea was that we wanted you to be able to, to sort of turn the layers of information on and off to make it easier to, to understand them. So if, you, um, if we click these on and off, um, we, can see, uh, we can see different elements of the map. Um, parking meters uh, is also a layer that, that is relevant in some neighborhoods, um, being of course primarily in the downtown area, but also in some of the neighborhoods. Um, so that's just by way of orienting you to, um, to the map that we linked you to. So it gets very busy when you add all the layers, but this-, last, this For anyone not, interested, that last layer is zoning. This is yeah. the board, this is the, the zoning ordinance this is the zoning table and what it kind of looks like if you make it a pictogram with uh, colors. These are all the different types of zones popping up all over the place. Um, so let's go, let's, let's um, turn on the neighborhood, the parking zone. And let's start working through um, at Alder Festa, if we can work through your meeting or your, your neighborhood to just to, Holly, can you show that's the screen again, share the map of showing where the East Rock and the Quinnipiac Meadows and the Fairhaven zones are. So we're really hoping to, to use your local knowledge. As you can see, East Rock 1 and East Rock 2, the dividing line is Willow Street. Um, so we, we, we saw a lot of, um, we saw a lot of, uh, in the lower East Rock, East Rock 2, East Rock 3, a lot of the streets have already been regulated for residential parking. In East Rock 1, not as much. Um, but we thought that Willow Street being such a major roadway uh, was a very was a fairly natural break in your in, in this section. Would you agree with this? Would you re recommend two zones or is three zones the right number for 
for East Rock. And of course, you're not the only person with East Rock, but you know, we also will do this with each of the elders. I guess the question is when you're creating the zones, are you considering how many cars are possibly located residentially in those areas? For example, East Rock one, as well as two and possibly three have many multifamily homes, some with off street parking, some without. Uh, so it becomes a challenge in that regard. Do you consider the quantity of, I guess, the cars and population when determining these zones? Yes, and and the way that we do that is is you know by geo you know rough geography. We're, we're trying to like putting like with like. So there's a lot in East Rock too. The housing stock is all fairly um, two three family homes with a couple of apartment buildings on the side. Um, so the, so to the short answer is yes, sort of, in a way, as approximate, as approximation, yeah. Yeah, I would say Willow Street is a good breaking point if that was your initial question. No, that's, and it, um, this is exactly the kind of, you know, feedback. Um, East Rock 3 would also include um, Cedar Hill, you know. And, you know, the, the park being such a natural, um, the park being such a natural barrier you're not going to get people driving from one side of East Rock One to the other if it were all res residential restricted. You wouldn't really see that kind of happening because the natural barrier of the park. Yes. Over in over in Quinnipiac Meadows, you want to um, keep keep walking through. Uh, here we go. Oh, Fair Haven's next. I'm sorry. Oh my God. Um, you know, we thought using Grand and Ferry as the big dividers to make quadrants. I know you, you, you're on the northern edge of that, right, Alder Festa? Um, yes. Okay. And so and when we're going through this, we're really, we're really hoping to, to pick your brain on the, on the streets in your ward. And we do this with every single Alder to let them speak specifically of their knowledge of, um, of the localized knowledge. And then Quinnipiac Meadows, again, we just kind of divided in half using Quinnipiac Avenue as a dividing line. Now, again, just to, just again to clarify, this does not create any new restricted parking. This just creates the zones in case anyone at a later date wanted cr to create restricted parking. So can you just reiterate, um, this is not giving folks residential parking where they have to go and get their decals. This is just creating zones that currently do not exist, or maybe if they do exist, modifying them in some way to make it easier to follow. That's exactly right. And I don't know, um, Holly, if you have that residential parking map that I showed, uh, just to kind of, if I can share a screen really quickly, Holly, and if Holly, if you could pull up a, um, a citywide map of all of the zones that we're talking about creating. I'll kind of share the, um, presently the city just, if you can see this color, I hope it's dark enough for you. Um, only, only the boxes in green have been created in zones so far. And we just wanna create zones everywhere. Again, it does not, to your point, um, Madam Chair, does not create any new restrictions, but it would, it would, it would, create the zones and su um, sufficiently, it would, by creating the zones of the Board of Alders once, making every street in the city in a zone, we would then turn the process into a much simplified 30-day process requiring the Board of Alders letter, the petition of 51% of the street, and then at the tra we would take that together to the traffic authority and the traffic authority would pass this. So we would be just by, we would just be doing this first step citywide for every street in New Haven and then letting the second step come at a later date. You can see if uh, Holly has the citywide map, the difference uh, in how much coverage we're talking about in the zones only. And do you mean this one? Yeah, that's perfect. So this, the only places we're proposing not to create zones would be in downtown and Long Wharf. Um, no residences in Long Wharf and the downtown. We're saying that the central business district, 
the BDs, the, uh, um, the downtown zoning does not, uh, does not, you know, contemplate a residential parking zone. So then back to you, Madam Chair, we would, we would wanna do this with each of the alders. Um, we've sent out packets to let folks start. Uh, there, are, there are, if anyone is, is um, daring, I think you're more daring than I, then um, you can actually adjust the map in real time. Is that right, Holly? Yes. Uh, you wanna show? There is a link in here to edit the map. And there are instructions on how to do so using a Google map. So we're, we're literally asking you to kind of draw on the map where you think if no change, no change is great. If Willow Street is the correct boundary, no change. You can just shoot us an email and say, I'm good if this would work for my, for my streets. Um, if you wanted to make a change, there are ways to do it. Uh, like I said, if you're tech savvy, um, if you're if you're not as tech savvy, I can't do this. Actually, I think you just uh, we can meet together and schedule a Zoom, and we can do this together and, and get your feedback one by one as well. We're hoping to finish feedback by the end of the calendar year. We would turn that. This is a draft draft map of zones. We would take your feedback from all of the alders, give chance and a, a chance through the holidays to do it. Turn that into a final draft. And we would resubmit that final draft as legislation for the board to consider um, taking up le that legislation to create all of these zones at once. And my imagination, my, I imagine that would come back through a um, either legislative or CSEP hearing and a public hearing then would be uh, appropriate to invite the public to kind of come and testify to that part. While, we're, while we submit it, we, our, our intent is to go out to management teams and, and invite folks to that public hearing at the Board of Alders process to make sure that we're going through you uh, and the Board of Alders uh, in, this, in this conversation. Okay, so just for clarification purposes, the only thing you're asking us to do is to look at the zones that you have mapped out currently and make any changes where we feel a zone should either be extended or maybe decreased, but it doesn't, I mean, this isn't something we need to go to our constituents with right now. I mean, it looks like you're gonna do a road show later on down the road. And of course, modifications can be made based on that as well. Is that, my, is that the correct understanding? Yeah. Until it's passed and it's final completion, um, edits are more than welcome. I think the um, public hearing process at the, at the chamber, once it's resubmitted as a final draft, the public may have some additional comments. We're really looking, like you said, Madam Chair, to, to see if the zones are in the right place. If there's too many zones. If you have thoughts on if, if, if the neighborhoods you represent should have fewer or more, um, really the local knowledge of each of the wards is so critical to making these boundaries make some sense. You know, We decided instead of, instead of, um, instead of Alder, Manic, Alder District or uh, State Rep District or Board of Education District, we just decided with neighborhood um, figuring that a lot of folks probably know their neighborhood best as far as their, their place modifier. So we, we were thinking just using that neighborhood boundary as a way to kind of group folks together. Okay. Um, are you ready to take questions from colleagues? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. So I will start with my vice chair, Alder DeCola. Do you have any questions? No, 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 right now, thank you. Alder Roth? Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, both Doug and Holly for presenting um, and the time you put into this. I, I do have a few questions. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I find this confusing because in my ward, I already have zone three and there's and then I have downtown essentially. So I haven't really thought to be honest about the fact that there aren't zones in many parts of the city. So I guess am I finding this confusing because I already have it kind of the idea of creating a new zone doesn't really apply to me perhaps if I'm understanding correctly, but I may be very confused. Holly, are you pulling it up? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think generally for, for you, Alder Roth, it's um, uh, yeah, it'd be renaming zone three basically. 
to a different to a different zone. Um, okay, th th thank you for that. And then I guess my question about downtown is: it? I mean, right now th there isn't a zone parking downtown, so is it? It wouldn't be changing anything. It would just be that you'd kind of be saying the rest of the city is suddenly getting these zones and they aren't, but currently they don't have any any residential parking zone. Is that correct as well? Uh, I'm so sorry. Can you ask that this question? Sure, again? sure. No, I asked in a convoluted way. I'm just sort of thinking about downtown and making sure um, that they're not losing something they have now in terms of parking. I mean, I, I think right now there is not a residential parking zone downtown. And so this actually wouldn't change anything for them other than them perhaps saying, hey, why is the rest of the city getting these zones and we're not getting anything? It, sure, that, yeah, that, is, that is accurate. Okay, thank you. And, and the reason they, you know, the reason that downtown does not have a residential parking zone is because it's a central business district. And so the central business district zoning was left out of any opportunity to get into the residential parking zones. It, that's by ordinance? It, uh, it's, well, um, it's a residential zone rather than a business. I mean, everything's very murky with the ordinances. Uh, so there's a lot of interpretation for the director to make recommendations. My recommendation is to not allow downtown residents to have a residential parking zone or else all of your streets will be clogged with residents parking their streets and there'll be no other parking available for the central business district. And so the zoning, you know, sort of ties that off one to one pretty nicely. Um, because yeah, it's a it's not the streets are not supposed to function as a private storage for private vehicles, uh, particularly in the downtown. Thank you. And then I'll just one more question and I'll defer to my colleagues. Um, and I guess and this and tell me if this isn't if this is a little off point. I guess I'm thinking we're we're doing this in part so that will make sure, I mean, you, you, it's impressive how you looked at where all the bus stops are and things like that to try to deter, uh, to ensure that people who actually live there have a, hit, have the ability to park. I guess my question is in enforcement, like ha, ha, are, are we gonna have the capability to make sure the people parking in these zones really are the people who um, are allowed to park in the zones? Yeah, we have uh, purchased an LPR license plate reader system, just like the police department and the tax office has. And um, the short answer is yes, we we hit each zone one once in the morning, once in the afternoons, and then by complaints, we follow up a lot more. Um, we do not have a walking beat for these uh, for any of the zones. Um, and the work in front of us tonight is not to create any additional restrictions, but just to create the baseline zones for which restrictions could be created later. Great, thank you. Thank you, Alder Rald. Alder Winter, any questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. You mentioned like uh, license plate readers. Are those the the devices that you see on the back of police vehicles, like on the corners of the vehicles? It is, yes. Is it, I had asked, the last time I saw someone from the traffic enforcement unit with one of those devices, I asked him about it and he said that there were changes to the software and that the city hadn't purchased the software upgrade and that they weren't operational. Um, do you know anything more about that or whether will the, will this, will the system, do the system we have have, would they have working software or <laughs> sort of a strange question, but I asked because it came up. Um, I'm not sure about the systems that exist. We, the tra traffic and parking does not own any of these systems. So uh, you'd have to ask any, the department who owns the, the system you're talking about, but yeah, we'll maintain ours art. Ours would be maintained through our enforcement contract and uh, require to have up-to-date software licensing. Okay, so you're not using them yet, but you would, you would if you, in the future, you plan to. Yes, we we've been attempt we've been working on purchasing these for some time, and they're finally starting to uh, come in. We have the vehicles to install them to, and um, and we we plan on installing them in the next few months. What's the rationale with having so many zones? Like, 
why not have one East Rock zone or one Prospect Hill zone or one New Hallville zone? I feel like the city is already broken up into 30 wards, you know, dozen police districts and management team districts. Yeah. And I, yeah, I guess I wonder about that. What yeah, is the, no, no. that's a great question. I think my answer would be that um, people are, humans are really lazy and if you give them the chance, they will do anything to um, beat the system, if you will. It's actually, it's like a great combination of, um, of uh, exceptional uh, sort of, I don't know. So it, basically, if you, were, if you were living on Cold Spring, way in deep East Rock, you could, if you were in the same zone as Bradley Street, you could drive to Bradley Street and park your car all day. And people do that. Uh huh. So the idea is to break that up and to make it less of an incentive to just drive your car closer in your neighborhood and then walk the rest of the way in downtown. So we tried to make some balance between um, zones that are too big and zones that are too small. Uh, but we definitely don't know if we got it right. That's for sure. So if we have if we have three in East Rock and it should be two, uh, if we have two in Dwight and it should be three, you know maybe maybe Beer Street has too many to to the chair's point earlier. You know maybe Beer Street has a lot of multifamilies that all have no parking and no driveway. Um, so maybe Dwight needs to be three instead of two. But the general reason of creating more than one in the first place was to create the disincentive of driving closer to your work and, and sort of quote unquote, you know, work in the system or, or cheating the system to use residential parking as uh, employee parking. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and it, I guess, is that problem, that problem, seems like like you were saying in the presentation localized to some areas of the city um but we think it makes sense to be splitting up all of the neighborhoods into multiple zones or you're saying we, we don't know that that's just what we propose and maybe you know maybe that's not appropriate that's a great point um maybe it's not appropriate to have two east shores you know maybe it should be one east shore um because to your point there's not a lot of demand fighting for the parking in the area. So, you know, my, my, my thinking was do it once, do it right, do it forever, um, instead of coming back and making new zones later or something like that. But uh, Holly, if you could throw up the, the citywide map on the screen. Um, uh, we're open to suggestions. Okay. We've now made our, our permit process digital, starting with this permit season. So, the number of permits is not as hard to manage. So we're not gonna buy like two different East Shore blue permits to send you a hang, to, you know, we're not gonna send you a sticker anymore. So the number of permits is not as, not as, um, not as constraining potentially as it used to be. Would you like me to zoom into a particular area? Yeah, his Me? is uh, yeah, uh, New Hallville and Prospect Hill, a little bit of East Rock. Yeah, I guess I wonder about like New Hallville, for example. Like, is there is there really natural dividing line there? Um, and I, yeah, I'm not sure that there is. Um, so that was sort of that was the root of my question. Anyway. Yeah, and this one jogs, huh? What, what if you could zoom in a bunch, Holly? We'll be able to see what street that is, the the border and in the divider of Prospect Hill. It's a uh, Shelton Avenue. Uh, yeah. It's it's yeah, uh, Division Street and Canner Street between the two Prospect Hill segments. And what about the two New Hallvilles? 
continue all of those is a Shelton get yeah, right. And, you know, this is where the localized knowledge is so important. Um, yeah, uh, Alder Winter, your, your, your opinion is much more valuable than mine in this case. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Alder Winter. I, you know, um, Doug, you mentioned something about, you know, residential parking as employee parking. Um, so I can drive my car within my zone, just closer to my area of employment and either walk or hop on public transportation or the Yale shuttle, whatever the case may be. But my concern is not so much the residents, it's actually outsiders that come in and park um, on residential streets, whether they are permitted or not and use public transportation to their area of employment. What, how are we gonna address those vehicles? Are we gonna rent yep. them spots, offer them spots, offer them permits for a price? Yeah, um, we, the department would very much like to offer them permits at a price, uh, but the first step in all of that is to create residential only parking. So the, the first thing is how do you stop them from doing it would be to institute residential parking zones on the streets. So I'm sorry, to restrict parking to residential only. The, sorry, my language, I, I just don't wanna confuse. So um, for instance, if you can zoom in Holly into the Prospect Hill East Rock border on the Whitney Avenue border, if you will. Um, you can see uh, a few streets that have been turned on for residential parking only, the restrictions. Um, so take like, uh, is it Bishop Street that has no restriction there, Holly, if you keep zooming in? I can't read your... Um... Uh, Bishop Street, no, Bishop Street has restrictions. Uh, oh, yeah. Part of Lawrence Street doesn't... Let's say Cottage, right? So Cottage Street, that has no restriction, correct? That's right. Uh, so let's say you, uh, Alder uh, for Cottage Street recognizes that people are, are driving in from out of town, parking on Cottage, and then walking to Orange Street and taking the Yale shuttle bus in town all day long. Um, at the moment, uh, cars are allowed to do that. There's no residential restriction on the street. Well, the, the first that, block of Cottage Street has a residential zone. Yes, that's correct. That took a lot of efforts to create, I remember. Um, so this, <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> so, so part of the draft draftness, the draftiness of this document. Is, yes, we'll uh, fix that. There you go. Um, but uh, so, you know, so let's say folks are driving into cottage, parking there, and then taking the bus. And we wanted to uh, protect parking for residents as well as sort of um, create parking opportunities that that create revenue for the city, as well as sort of manage parking demand. Uh, what we would recommend would be to restrict the parking on cottage to resident only, and then via a letter from the alder, allow the department to sell daytime permits on top of that residential restriction. We've built into our budgets, uh, the pricing structure for those permits. We've not yet sold any permits. We've not yet found any um, guinea pig streets to do this on yet. We would love any recommended options. What we recommend to do is something like, let's take a Bishop Street, which has restriction already. Um, you know, we would do some traffic counts. We would do some parking counts. We would try and find out uh, how many parking spaces were taken each day for a little while, how many parking spaces were available. And then the department would recommend a certain number of permits that we could sell on top of the residential zone. For instance, in Bishop Street, let's say every day we drove down for two weeks and we found about 30 parking spaces available, maybe more. We would recommend something like 10 of them to be sold to the public. And so 10 people would be able to buy residential street parking on Bishop Street. It would be non-guaranteed. It would be a monthly cost. Um, and this would be a way for commuters to not pay the full freight at their employer-based parking, uh, to park in neighborhoods, to park in the to, to utilize our streets that are going unused potentially, 
and then either walk into their job or to finish the last portion of their commute on bus or transit. Um, so this would be our, this is our department's recommendation as a best practices, sort of make sure you create this, you know, you lock down the supply of parking for residences and then you figure out how much is excess and you can sell off that excess at a certain rate in order to avoid building giant garages all over town in order to maximize the utilization of all of the transit access we have in, down, in, the, in and around downtown. And in order to put a lot of eyes and ears on the street, you know, without necessarily having sworn officers, we get a lot more eyes and ears. If we get folks that are transit taking, um, parking here and then taking transit and going in town, it's like a lot of dog walkers on the street. It's like a little public safety trick uh, in the parking world. So I probably strayed and I shouldn't have because that's not the topic of discussion. No, that's okay. I, it's just um, a thought. And all you have to do really is look up where all the Yale shuttle stops are and you could determine where the parking issues are for uh, residents when the outsiders come in and park. But at this point, I'm going to continue on with my colleagues questioning if Alder Singh, if you have any questions. No, Madam Chair, no questions. I just have to go to work for Doug and look on the maps and see if the lines are, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. we'll work for him. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alder Singh. Alder Smith, any questions? I think we may have lost Alder Smith. I do see a hand up from, uh, oh, before we continue, I just want to recognize Evelyn Rodriguez has joined us as well. Um, before I move on to my colleagues that are not on the committee, are there any Thank other you. committee members that have questions for Mr. House Layden or Ms. Parker? And if you do just raise your hand because I don't see you on my screen. Okay, then I will move on to Alder Kim Edwards who has her hand up and uh, welcome. Alder Edwards, and please, your questions. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. One of my questions, I don't know if you actually answered it, but you said you were trying to do this zoning without using defined aldermanic um, wards or restrictions. And I'm going to use Cottage Street for an example. Cottage Street, I have one side of it. Another alder has another side of it. What do you do when there's a conflict where my people don't want it, but the other side may um, want it? How do you split that off? Because that's going to happen in a lot of our areas. Um, for instance, even like Division Street, I have a side of Division Street in order. Um, Winter has another side of Division Street, you know, a different block. Like, how do you resolve those actual issues with a particular street if you're not using those aldermanic boundaries? That's a great question. So our zones are tied more to neighborhoods, but when the restrictions go to get created, they get created at the street by the block by block level. So they get created. So if you're sharing Cottage Street between the two of you, Alder Edwards gets to speak for the even side addresses and Alder Winter gets to speak for the odd side addresses, for instance. And, but uh -huh. that's how we would do it. We would put residential parking on one side of the street, only one side of the street, not both. Um, okay, so. Uh -huh. yeah, go ahead. We have, and we have that in a couple of places. Go ahead. Okay, so you are still taking that into account as far as having say, even though you're trying to kind of eliminate those boundaries per se and doing it by neighborhood. Um, because there's so many of us that I have a half, they have the other half. Right. Um, and it does become an issue. Um, that's a great and, point. And, and, and I, I may... use, and you spoke of New Hallville, for instance. Um, I have Sheffield Avenue and Division Street, and we have issues. There might not be a shuttle right there on, the, on that particular street or that particular block, but we have not only Yale, we have Science Park, and of course we have Yale again because there's Yale owns a building in Science Park. And they're now taking up all the parking spaces on a residential street. 
so our residents cannot park. Right. And it's the same thing that's happening on Whitney Avenue. So I just want to make sure we're able to still counter this, you know, because it, it, there is going to be a difference from one side of the street to the other. Can I just make a comment on that? Again, I think that's um, the same discussion that I was having, um, Alder Edwards, and mm -hmm. I think that's the next phase. What we're doing tonight and what our homework is as Alders is to determine zones. And then we need to have further conversation on exactly what you're talking about. All right. Nope, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Yes. All yeah. right, so I just want to make sure we're clear and I'm understanding this properly. So when I look at my map and I speak to um, director yep. of traffic and parking, we're on the same page yep. um, because, you know, we have a lot of this boundary issues and not only boundary issues, but one section is a little different from the other. That's right. And In the, the same the, neighborhoods. Yep. And the lower part of Newhallville is getting very busy with uh, daytime and nighttime parking. Exactly. You know, and the upper part of New Hallville is mostly busy in the nighttime for parking, right? Exactly. So, uh, and so, you know, and, and just as the chair said, and, and um, as mentioned, what, what your homework is right now is just creating the, the zones. If you mm -hmm. do want to create that restricted parking so that only neighbors can park, we do that through the aldermanic petition process, through mm -hmm. a letter of support, and we take that to the traffic authority. Um, okay. After, 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 if there's a zone in existence already, you can just go right to the mm -hmm. traffic authority. If there's no zone, you can wait until if we do this work together, we create the zones, and then you can just go to the traffic authority. You know, that's that's the funniest part. Like if you're trying to create something from new, um, Abby, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not Abby. Excuse me, Holly. Sorry, <laughs> that's uh, okay. Uh, Holly, if you could go over to Front Street and, and show me uh, front, uh, front and Grand Avenue. Um, so, so, so go to the east, go to the right, um, and uh, keep going, keep going. You see Grand there. Keep going to the right a little bit more. Yep. And then up just a scotch. And if you zoom in, you know, there's like Zone 8 is like three houses on Front Street. For all of zone eight, if you scoot just to the right a little bit more, Holly, sorry about that. Um, I, don't, I, I don't even know if you can see it, but it's it's just like four houses. Yeah, it's just like those four houses on Front Street up there. Um, but it's all that was created at the time was a zone that was three houses big. You know what I mean? So if anybody ever wants to get an, another zone two houses down, they got to go through the whole aldermanic legislative process to create a bigger zone. And then, you know, um, but for now, so we're just really trying to make these zones make sense. And then block by block, alder by alder, if we want to turn the restricted parking on, we'll do that with petitions following up. After that. Okay, thank you. And I have no further questions at this time, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Alder Edwards. Um, alder Roth. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And and maybe this is beyond the scope of tonight. I guess I'm just trying to understand the 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 restricted parking on the streets. Like if like either people won't think they need it because if there's new zone parking, like they'll feel like you're gonna have this enforcement that they'll be able to get a place close enough to their house, or else like will there be I don't know. Do you think this will change the demand for people to be like, I want my own street? I, I don't, I don't know. I guess I, I don't really know. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of the kind of the interplay between the two things and why there would be a big, the zones, I guess maybe I'm thinking the zones are getting so small that you really need to then even have that second step almost, but. And just remember the zones do not create additional restrictions. Yeah. Well, they restrict people outside. I thought people outside the zone can't park there. Well, when you, it's, so where the red lines are, Holly, if you can just zoom in on the re Willow Street red lines, yeah. So the, where the restrictions are, where these red lines are, that's where the residential, zone, that's where only residents are allowed to park. But as you can see, there's dozens of streets around them that do not have any restrictions. And so I think this goes to your earlier point that every residential street in your ward has a has a residential zone, Abby. 
is in zone three, is already turned on. But so could someone though in East Rock zone one park well, I guess they can't, okay. So maybe I'm just confused because it's kind of the existence I have now is like this. So I'm not sort right. of understanding. Right. right, I think it's kind of bringing all the other, we're, you're, you're like the only ward that has every residential street with a resident, with a parking restriction already for residents. Okay, I'll, I'll stop my question. He's <laughs> an outlier, thank you. And maybe I wonder if it's helpful to think of it in terms of the fact that these streets that have restrictions, um, you know, people are going to park on the streets that don't have restrictions. So it puts a, an undue burden on those streets, you know, when people are trying to find a spot and um, evade paid parking. So that's why it can become an issue. And that's why you want to have the flexibility to be able to make changes easily. Mm -hmm. Alder, Festa, if you can just, you know, chime in right, right there where all of the restricted parking is. And, you know, that's the Willow Street Business District. That's East Rock Global Magnet. That's a couple of big job creators there where there's a big demand for parking. And you can see it play out in the regulations after mm -hmm. a few well, this is where it's going to get a little confusing if we have zone one and zone two for East Rock because there's uh, residential parking in both where people that park in zone one could technically park in zone two and still be close to their homes and vice versa. So anyway, but this is a, that's a discussion we can have offline too, or we can redefine um, I actually didn't realize that some of those streets are residential parking only, quite honestly. Mitchell Drive has no parking, so that is irrelevant. And there's also a commuter lot on the corner of Willow and Mitchell Drive, where folks from the East Rock School Park, as well as um, the Marlin Building, but that that's off record, <laughs> somewhat conversation that we can have. Um, but I'll do my homework. Um, I do see Alder Evelyn Rodriguez's hand up. Uh, Alder Rodriguez, if you are on, please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Um, I understand that, um, I understand about the, the permits. I, and I understand why you're suggesting the zoning, but what I have a little difficulty is actually the defining the zones. That's what I have a little bit of difficulty with. So I was hoping you could help me, uh, give me a better description of what would be a good zone. Thank you. And can you hear me now, Alder Rodriguez? Yes. So on the screen, I have shared Hill 1, Hill 2, Hill 3. Um, and are you seeing it? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, so we thought, you know, and let us know if we're right, we're wrong, if we should change it. Um, you know, we thought Columbus Avenue was a good divider. Um, and then then again, Lamberton Street, uh, or maybe it's Kimberly Avenue. You know, I'm not, I'm not too sure here. You know, this is uh, a work in progress. Obviously, that's why we're asking for input. But um, you know, we think that with the amount of households in the hill, it's a very large neighborhood already, right? Um, take the cemetery and take the uh, the West River portion out, the hill north part. You know, that would be a different different section, but. Um, between Winthrop and Columbus up in Hill One. And what do you think? How do you, how do you think we did there? You see, that's what I, I would like to know a little bit more about what would define, what would define a good zone? I mean, because I see a lot of streets there mm -hmm. in, in Hill One, 
as you've defined it, Hill 2 and Hill 3. In Hill 1, I see there's a lot, a lot of streets there. So yeah. what is it exactly that you'd like to see us do in reference to defining the zones? A good question. I think it's creating a, you know, right now, a zone, you're in zone 14, you know, your existing zones. Um, and, you know, right now, is that working for you? Is that, is that the right okay, side? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't see it now. Oh. Sorry about that. My my apologies. Um, so the question is, uh, you know, would someone drive from one part of the zone to another to go to work? Like if you were living on Congress and Bond or Congress and West, would you drive 10 blocks and park on Howard Street to work at the hospital? Um, that's kind of a that's kind of how we're gut checking the size of a zone and what we can also meet offline and talk mm -hmm. a little bit more fully about the hill if you would like and more sure. More, more. Um, sure because for example if I were to live on Bond Street and I wanted to I could easily walk to the hospital I mean and there's like about ten streets before I get to the hospital yeah. My guess is you would walk, not drive, but that's just my guess, you know, and that's kind of, that's kind of the gut level of, of boundaries that we're working with here. Okay, but if I was, let's say I lived in West Haven. Correct. And I parked on Bond Street and then walked the rest of the way, you see what I mean? Then that's where it would be maybe beneficial to the residents that live on Bond Street to have permit parking. That's right. And just like you did with Port C Street, if we would like um, any street to have residential parking, you know, residential only parking, we would just do the petition. We would take the petition through. Uh, mm -hmm. If there's a zone existing, and I think there is for zone for Bond Street, let's go, let me zoom in on Bond here. Mm, I don't think, so. not for Bond. Well, so this is what's so weird about it, the way that we do this is that zone 14 is, it, it, it exists. And the way that zone 14 was created was by legislation. Someone submitted 25 years ago, a residential zone of this size that they submitted as a, that was passed by the Board of Alders. But as mm -hmm. you can see, zone street, uh, Bond Street is not yet restricted but it mm -hmm. is inside of zone 14. So okay. if you wanted to restrict it, just like you did with Port C Street, you mm -hmm. would just have to do a petition. We would take that to the traffic authority right now and we would yeah. approve that at the traffic authority. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, you know, um, zone 14 is larger than what we proposed with respect to Hill 1, 2, and 3, right? Yes. So zone 14 we thought was a little too large. You know, just too many households in there. And um, so we wanted to break it up a little bit. And we used the east-west road of Columbus to break that up. Mm -hmm. And I do understand that a decision could be reversed if the families, um, let's say, for example, on Portsea Street felt that permit parking was not conducive for them. That, that that could be reversed, that there is a process to do that, right? That's a great question. Yes, there is a process to undo residential uh, streets. It would just be the same process to make them, 51%, and we would take it to the traffic authority. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ma um, Madam Chair. Thank you, Alder Rodriguez, for your questions. I will uh, put it out there to Colleagues, again, if you have questions, please raise your hands before I open it up to the public. Okay, seeing no hands from colleagues, I will ask if there is anyone from the public that would like to comment on this item. Second time, anyone from the public that would like to comment on this item? And for a third time, anyone from the public that would like to comment on this item? 
Okay, seeing none, um, I think further conversation is needed I, for clarification, but we were all given a, a link to look at the different zones. So if you as alders need to make any changes, do so real time on that link and submit it to Mr. House Layden. Um, it, it says by the end of the month, but that doesn't give us a lot of time. Can that be extended? Meant to be end of the year. I meant it to be end of December. My apologies. Okay, so we have as alders till the end of December to submit our suggestions of zones within our uh, area, within our ward. And if you have to have conversations with your colleagues that you border with, feel free to do so. And of course, Director House Layden has also offered up his time to meet with anyone who has any questions, concerns, or even suggestions. Uh, so with that, thank you, Director House Layden. Thank you, Ms. Parker, for all your work. And we look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. Okay. To I move I, to close the public section. Do I hear a second? Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Everyone in agreement with closing the public portion of this meeting. Alder Decola? Yes. Roth? Yes. Winter? Yes. Thing? Yes. Smith? And myself, I am a yes as well. Would anyone like to move the first item? I move item one. Item second. one has been moved and seconded. Any discussion on item number one, which is uh, the crosswalks, the creative crosswalks? Any discussion? Oh, go ahead, Alder Roth. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. The, I think this is a terrific project. Town Green did a great job in reaching out to the community over, I mean, well over a year. They had all sorts of workshops and they were at the farmer's market and lots of input from people. I think um, it's it's an area, I, I hate crossing at Chapel and State. It's so unattractive right now. I think it will do a great job at both beautifying a space and really connecting different neighborhoods as is its um, the, the reason for it. And so I hopefully it will become a model for other other locations around the city because I think it's wonderful. Thank you, Alder Roth. Any other discussion on this item? Alder Singh? I, I, you know, I'm very much supportive of this program for especially beautifying our sidewalks and our crossing. It's bring more of a friendly and safety atmosphere, you know, the sense of just being, feel safe. It's so I, it's a good idea and I hope it would, you know, this model will catch on to the rest of our neighborhood in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Singh. Anyone else from the committee that would like to comment on this item? Okay. Um, I encourage everyone to vote for this. I think lighting is something that people are always in favor of, and this will provide additional lighting and, you know, more people that walk, the safer our streets are. So um, it seems like a really cool project as well. And I look forward to seeing the final product once uh, hopefully it will be voted on in favor. If there are no further discussions, we'll take a vote on this item. All those in favor, please say yes. Alder DeCola? Yes. Alder Roth? Yes. Alder Winter? Yes. Alder Singh? Yes. Alder Smith? And I too am a yes. Are there any nays? Speak now. Any abstentions? Okay, the yeas have it, motion carries. I move item two to read and file. Second. Um, you know what, I think this item should probably, we shouldn't make a motion on it is my opinion. We should keep it open because it seems like they're not ready to release a product and this conversation needs to continue. So 
I say we take no motion on it. Um, if you all agree, then we, we can keep it as no motion. Whatever, Any but we're not the body that purchase. We only approve purchases. So until the city wants to buy it, we can't do anything. And let's talk about it. We don't purchase, we approve. I understand so. that. The, the thing is, it seems like there's still conversation that needs to be had in regard to some of the equipment's availability and the purpose of it for institutions, et cetera. I mean, we could read and file it and then another um, uh, Only a workshop. You could have a workshop at any time. Noted. Any discussion on this item? I don't see any hands yeah. up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, Alder Singh, go ahead. Yeah, I think there's still more information need to come, you know, with this with this uh, technology. You know, there haven't been much study comes out of it. So I am still looking forward for more study information in this uh, technology. Okay, thank you, Alder Singh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Well, we can make a motion to read and file this, um, and then we can have another workshop down the road if that uh, makes um, sense. So yeah. all in favor? Yes. Ms. Madam Chair, I'm Alder Winter, I believe had a comment. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Go ahead, Alder Winter. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I would ag agree with uh, Alder saying that I think there's more study needed, and it would be helpful to know, you know, how this complies with future CDC guidelines and whether the EPA weighs in on on this uh, and uh, I yeah I wanted to also echo Alder Smith's con potential concerns about radiation and cancer and you know how long would something like this have to be out there before we would feel comfortable with that thank you madam chair thank you for your comments Alder Winter anyone else Yes, Alder Roth. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. No, I, I definitely echo both of my colleagues. I mean, both in terms of, um, I mean, one kind of does it, is it effective at, at with the virus um, completely? I mean, it's great that one study showed it was, but I think more studies need it. Two, when the cost comes down. Three, I definitely did have on the health front. I think there was one study is not enough. I think particularly with the amount of the amount it would have to be used to actually be effective to um, with the coronavirus, um, it seemed, yeah, it definitely seemed very premature. It was great to hear about it. I think it's definitely something to watch, um, but premature to act on in any way or to even recommend to the city as, as, our, as the vice chair pointed out, we only can approve funding, but um, thank you. Thank you, Alder Roth. I'll make it simple for everybody. I'll retract my motion. Like I said, this was not approved by the health department. They have reservations about it. Where does a body to approve? We could always have other workshops, but I'll remove my motion just so you could have it in your committee if that makes you all happy. No problem. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair. Then uh, for this item, we won't take a motion. If we have, uh, if we want to invite them back, we'll invite them back. Anyone like to move item? If everyone is in agreement with that, please say yay as I call your name, Alder Decola. Yes. Alder Roth. Yes. Alder Winter. Alder Singh. Yes. Alder Smith. And I am a yes. Did we lose Alder Winter? I just want to make sure I don't forget his vote in case he's on. Okay. Uh, is there anyone, any nays on this item? Okay. Any abstentions? Okay. The motion carries.
Madam Chair, I think Alder Winter um, just popped back up, but. Oh. Okay, Alder Winter, we were voting on item number two to take no motion on it. Are you a yay, a nay, or abstention? That's fine. Okay, I'm gonna take that as a yes. Again, uh, we will, the yeas ha have it. We will have no motion. So if we wanna just bring it back, we can bring it back down the road. Um, anyone wanna move the third item? I move item number three. Do Sorry. I hear a second? Okay, the item has been moved and seconded. Any discussion on item number three regarding the uh, zoning from transportation, traffic, and parking? The, Madam Chair, yes. we, we second and moved it to move it to what? Is this a read and file? This is a read and file, yes. Okay. Yeah. To make the motion, please, for read and file. Um, I move to read and file. Second to read and file. The motion has been made. Any discussion on read and file of item number three? Yes, Alder Roth. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, um, I appreciate it, the work um, that the presenters put into it. And it seems like process wise, we now have an assignment that it will move on um, to be reintroduced and there'll be a public hearing process eventually. So it makes sense procedurally to file to file the workshop item and then move forward with the kind of next steps once those arise. Thank you, Alder Roth. Uh, Alder Winter, I see your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Apologies, I'm having issues with my camera. Uh, so I'm not visible, but I, yeah, I, I do wonder about like having so many zones, if that's going to be confusing or inconvenient for residents. Um, and I, I suppose, well, you know, the way that the process is set up right now, it'll go out to all the alders so that they can look at their individual zones and, and maybe that will change. Uh, but uh, yeah, I could imagine situations where, you know, you've got different zones on the opposite side of the street and people are just saying, why did it get set up this way? So that it's, it's confusing for a lot of folks and going beyond what we need to do to solve some of the issues where we've got localized places where you have a lot of commuters using the parking. Um, but I do think that it's a like a reasonable template to have this set up and uh, and that it it seems like a good starting point for then the rest of the petition process. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Alder Winter. Any other colleagues that would like to uh, discuss this topic before we vote. Okay, I don't see any hands up. Okay, all in favor of read and filing item number three, Alder DeCola. Yes. Alder Roth. Yes. Alder Winter. Yes. Alder Singh. Yes. Alder Smith. And I am a yes as well. So the motion carries for read and filing that item. Do I move to adjourn? Second. All in favor of adjournment say aye. Alder aye. DeCola. Aye. I'll, I'll call each one. Sorry. Alder DeCola. Aye. Roth. Yes. Winter. Yes. Singh. Aye. Smith. And I am a yes as well. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you everyone for your time this evening. Look forward to seeing you soon. Good night. Oh,